Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. The Battle of the Alamo, the 13-day siege, the urgent calls for reinforcements, and the defiant pledge of victory or death all come down to this, a cold, dark morning with the Alamo garrison on the brink of attack. Today, exactly 188 years since the battle, we reveal how the Mexican army overtook the compound, the personal stories of the defenders and survivors, the critical information sadly lost to history, and why from the ashes of defeat, we will always remember the Alamo. I'm your host, Emily Bauckham. Here to take us through the Battle of the Alamo is Dr. Bruce Winders, the former Alamo curator who remains quite active here at the site. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. Our story left off last week with the final night of the siege, a quiet night, allowing the defenders time to rest. But it's a cold, cloudy night, foreshadowing the morning to come. The garrison had been under siege for 12 days, two weeks. The main question on their mind was, is help going to come? In the traditional story, the idea is no help's coming. But recent information, when I say recent, within the last 30 years, uh, indicates that help's on the way, they just don't get here in time. And so the garrison's wondering, when are they going to get here? When are they going to get here? Are they going to get here before the final attack? This, you have to imagine the stress, the stress of wondering when the attack's going to happen, where it's going to come from, just the environment. You know, we've all been camping. You know, imagine camping out for several weeks and trying to stay warm, trying to have enough food, food being uh, monotonous. And, uh, you know, what, what do you do to entertain yourself while you're waiting for the final attack? So it's, it's a very stressful uh, situation. How badly is Texas outnumbered? Texans are outnumbered considerably. It comes down into the battle about 10 to 1, but actually it's a little more. Uh, it's only 10 to 1 because not all the Mexican troops are put into the battle. Who are the defenders and where are they from? The defenders are typical early 19th century Republicans. And when I say Republicans, I'm not talking about modern politics, but I'm talking about they strongly believe in the idea of the republic. And they come from different walks of life. We tend to think of them as being frontiersmen, but many of them were lawyers, uh, businessmen, tradesmen, and they have, have come together to defend, not the Alamo, but defend San Antonio, which is on the frontier. By defending the frontier, it's let's keep the Mexican army on the frontier so they don't come into the colonies where our houses are, where our families are. Who was the youngest defender and who was the oldest? The youngest is usually identified as a young man named King, and uh, he was about 15 or 16. In today's world, that would be, you know, considered very young. But even back then, you know, 16 on, is on the cusp of manhood. And the oldest was uh, a man who was 56, you know, 56 it's, it's old back then. It's getting up It there. isn't ancient or decrepit, but war is a young man's game. What do we not know about the defenders that has just been lost to history? I think what we forget is we treat the defenders kind of like a movie where there are the stars, and we can name the stars, go Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, Travis, and then the defenders, the bulk of them, are, are the extras and where they're just kind of nameless, faceless. But I think what's important to remember is that they're, they're real people. Uh, they have families. And while we concentrate on, on Crockett and Bowie and Travis, when people back home learned of the, the other defenders being killed, uh, there was a real sense of loss because they had been part of vibrant communities before they go to Texas. And even in Texas, once they get established, if they're colonists, uh, they're part of the community. Otherwise, uh, they wouldn't be at the Alamo. And who was on the Mexican side? They were a true organized army with many trained by the Spanish. The Mexican army really was the, the remnants of the old Spanish army. Many of the officers or the cadre 
had come up under the Spanish, either in Mexico or, or other places that the Spanish had controlled. There are um, a class of officers who are Creoles, who are Mexican-born, but under the Spanish, they would have been second-class subjects. But now they're in charge, and that's people like Santa Ana and his, his lieutenants. So you have them in the ranks. What you really have are mixed bloods who are part Spanish, part or part Mexican, part Indians, and you have pure blood Indians. But the idea that I've always tried to, to express is that we, we think of Napoleon being in Europe, but his ideas and the Napoleonic mindset extends even to Mexico. And so this is a Napoleonic army. There are also people here in non-combat roles, women, children, and slaves. Why did they stay? Well, they stayed because there's really no other place for them to go. If you take um, Susanna Dickinson, she comes to San Antonio because she has a very brutal experience in Gonzales at the hands of Texan volunteers. So she comes here for safety. Ironically, it's not a safe place, but that's why she comes here. In the Mexican army, even though it's uh, organized, the supplies are not constant. There's not a medical department. And so we think of uh, at that armies of that time traveling with camp followers. These are members of their families that the army doesn't provide for your family to stay home, so your family travels with you. And your wives and your daughters... After you march, they cook for you and they care for you. And so there's really no place for them to go, so they stay with you. When you talk about servants and you talk about enslaved people, of course they're going to stay because they can't leave. The idea of the defenders not being able to leave, well, they volunteered to be there, and many of them believe in the cause of, of defending the frontier. You know, we have to stay here. And the idea, everybody knows this is so important, so of course help's going to come. When you look at the roads from East Texas up to Gonzales, there are reinforcements. They just don't get here in time. At dawn on March 6, 1836, Santa Ana gives the order to attack. The defenders run to their positions, and the Mexican army spots a weak spot in the north wall for perspective, the North Wall ran through the modern-day federal building and post office. The North Wall had been a problem because it's a, it's a large space. We believe it had fallen into disrepair during the uh, Siege of Behar and been fixed up by the Mexican Army. We think that the wooden braces, rather than being vertical, were horizontal, which essentially made them ladders. And so... The, the main attack comes from the North Wall and the attack that Santa Ana orders reinforcements into. So the North Wall is one of the major, I, I don't want to say breach because when a breach is so, sort of like an opening, but the attack comes over the wall. They find a way to get up and over the wall and then spill into the, to the plaza. There are probably local Incidents of uh, the Texans successfully pushing back the Mexicans. What the Battle of the Alamo is, in reality, it's, it's a series of small individual battles. And so you may be winning the battle that's right in front of you, but next to you, you've lost, and so you're being surrounded. And you may or may not realize it until it's too late. William Barrett Travis falls at the North Wall. How early was this in the battle? Travis's death is tragic, and it may be instrumental in the battle, but the garrison had been together for a very short time. And so chaining the chain of command, command and control, probably wasn't really well established. And this is a period between or without radios. And so how far does his voice carry? among all the shouting and the shooting. There are probably people on the west wall, on the south wall, that have no idea that he's alive or dead. So his death is 
is important, but it doesn't necessarily affect the outcome of the battle. You just wondered how far does Travis's voice carry? Well, what are the sounds of battle? We think cannon fire, gunshots, screaming. What about music, like drums? The music is important because voices don't carry. So traditionally music, drums, and bugles, they're relaying messages to advance, to retreat, to move to the left, move to the right. So they're conveying the orders that voices can't because they can't be heard. If you're on the wall, think about trying to be heard in a crowded restaurant and they add gunshots and screaming to that and very chaotic. There are animals, and so the animals are probably terrified. It, it, it's just very chaotic. It's hard to, to imagine. The place probably didn't smell like a rose. And day after day of wood smoke, the gunpowder, when it's burned, is very... Um, acidic spelling, very acid. As you paint this picture and the realities of war become more apparent to us in the modern day, well, the defenders knew they were probably going to die, but knowing versus experiencing two very different things. I often uh, point to Robert Burns' point that talks about glory. And in it, the, to paraphrase him, is that it's much better to die a glorious death in battle than to live for a long life and die the death of a, a nameless peasant. And there was a lot of that going on at that time. The idea that you wanted to live well, but you wanted to die well. And that doesn't mean they had a death wish, but the idea of uh, given the alternatives of, of how to die, you know, to die heroically, for her cause, was something they were willing to do, you know. And, and you see that in Travis's letters where he's talking about dying like a soldier and death in the cause of liberty. It's a different mindset. The Mexican army seizes the North Wall and then flow down the Western Wall, the modern-day Crockett and Woolworth buildings. What was there at that time? At the West Wall was a collection of former convent housing, the individual huts had been connected by single walls. And so from the outside, it looked like a, a solid wall. But like I said, it was segmented. On the northwest corner, you had a gun emplacement. But it's also in that northwest corner that you have some of the women and children. And as you go down the west wall, then there are gun emplacements and such. But the Alamos... Green B. Jameson, his, the engineer for the Alamos, had said that, you know, certainly this place, you can tell, it wasn't built by a military people or it's not a fortress. And there are doors and there are windows. And so not only are the Mexican troops coming into the plaza and being able to enter the buildings on the west side from inside the plaza, but on the outside, there are doors and windows that are being broken open and they're being able to enter that way. So it's, a, you know, very chaotic. The Alamo doesn't fall all at once. You know, it's, it's incremental as the Mexicans come over the north wall, southwest corner, breaking through the west wall. The southwest corner would have been where the Mission Gate and Lunette was. What happened there? The traditional entrance into the Alamo was, was on the south. It evidently was a, a um, formidable location because the Mexican troops take it in reverse. They come over the southwest corner and come into the lunette in that area from behind. Again, very chaotic. It's still dark, all the noise. But that's the area where uh, James Bowie is thought to be in his sick bed. In the low barrack. In the low barrack. What was the low barrack? Well, the low barrack was the south wall. It was a series of, of um, rooms that made up the gate that led into the Alamo. We, you know, we like to think of him in movies as being kind of ready for what happens and he has pistols and he's slashing with his knife. But he may have been so sick that he was killed in his bed without really putting up a resistance. Not because he's a coward, but because he's so sick. Did any defenders try to leave the compound during the battle? The fight is moving from the north wall, from the west wall, towards the long barrack, towards the church. There are indications from Mexican reports that 
a large number of the defenders leave the compound toward the southeast corner. And the idea is that they're not running away, but they're being pushed out and they're going out to find a better better location. And they're, they're killed because if you look at, again, this being a Napoleonic principle decided battle, uh, one of the things from uh, the attacking force is you use your mounted troops as a screen so that if there is a breakout attempt or if there is a movement outside the t- place that you're attacking, the mounted troops will intercept. Plus, they're there to intercept any reinforcements that try to come in. And so it fits the military logic of what's happening. And I don't see it as an act of cowardice, but it's an act of we're going to go fight somewhere where we can fight better. We're going to a better position. Falling back, maybe. We're, we're falling back. We're withdrawing. One of the Mexican reports does say that a large number are killed in a ditch. And so a ditch is like a trench. So where are you going to take refuge? You know, in some part that, that gives you something for protection. They're fighting till the end. With the Mexican army well inside Alamo walls, the fighting shifts to the lawn barrack as the defenders fall back, and the Mexican army uses cannons to break down doors. The cannon become very important. The Texans, they they have people in their ranks who have experiences as cannoneers, but the action's happening so fast that in artillery, one of the things is if you're being pushed off your guns, you're supposed to disable them so they can't be used against you. But the action's happening so fast that we think the defenders are being pushed off the guns. They leave them, the Mexican artillerist and infantrymen, seize the guns, ammunition's there, implements are there. They load them, they turn them, and they're able to fire essentially point blank into the long barrack. One of the things that's happening inside the long barrack, it isn't just a cannonball punching through the walls, but these are stone walls. And so when the cannonball hits the wall, it shatters the stone. So you have stone projectiles flying through the long barrack, essentially like shrapnel. Uh, again, confusion that from Mexican accounts, some of the defenders are trying to surrender. As they would approach them, others would fire. Other Texans would fire on them. And, of course, that's going to make the Mexican troops uh, angry, furious. And so once they do get into the long barrack, it turns into a brutal uh, hand-to-hand combat where many of the Texans are probably put to death with bayonets and club muskets. You talk about shrapnel flying. The lawn barrack also had a hospital. So imagine being in that hospital. Well, the hospital is on the, on the second story, but accounts are there's tens, 20, 30 convalescing defenders there. Some even from the December Battle of uh, Bayar, the Mexican troops break into the hospital and they don't spare anybody. So again, very, very brutal battle. At one point, the Mexican army tries to take down the Texan flag from that original second floor roof of the lawn barrack. Yes, and this is, uh, it's noted by several Mexican accounts that a Mexican lieutenant is shot down while he's trying to take a, a flag down. You know, scenes of heroics on both sides. The battle then moves to the now iconic Alamo Church. Tell us about the palisade where David Crockett fought and the scene of some truly close hand-to-hand fighting. Well, the palisade is going to be effective if you attack it from the front. You know, it's a defensive position. But the Mexican troops are able to come into the compound, and essentially it becomes a worthless, well, it becomes an, an obstacle. And so we think the defenders in that area, if they're not killed, they may have withdrawn into the church and then are pursued by Mexican troops who killed them inside the church. Will we ever know the exact spot where Crockett died? No, we won't. I I think the thing that we'd say is we know that Crockett died, but but we will never know the exact spot. And I think that's, um, you know, it goes to his notoriety even today, but even back then the idea was what what happened to Crockett. 
Is our best guess right outside the Alamo Church by the Palisade? That's where uh, Susanna Dickens said she saw him was um, out in front of the church. So that's become sort of the accepted position of his death. Take us now inside the Alamo Church. What did it look like? It had been fortified by the Mexican military engineers. Uh, There's a, a large ramp that goes up the center of the church towards the towards the back there's an artillery platform looking eastward and uh, then in the sacristy the side rooms those had been designated as quarters for at least two families the sacristy had a roof the sacristy had a roof the church itself didn't have a roof so it's open so the defenders if you're inside the church you're under the sky you're under the stars but the sacristy was, um, had a roof, so it was deemed to be suitable quarters for families. And it was occupied by the Dickinson family and the Esparza family. The fighting inside the Alamo Church was the defender's last stand. What happened, and how did this battle end? It, in my mind, again, applying this to other battles, it ends rather sporadically. It ends, some places it ends, other places on the compound fighting still going on. But essentially, toward the end, uh, the defenders are, are killed either in small groups or one by one. And so if you're listening from a distance, there's a, the noise of battle slowly decreases until it's silent. The uh, one thing that has always struck me is that at most battles, you know, it's over, and you say, well, there are people who are killed, but there are wounded. But at the end of the Battle of the Alamo, there are no wounded, and it's a deliberate act. And so the decision had been made by the Mexican government, Santa Ana, that these defenders would be treated as pirates and therefore they would be put to death if they were captured on the battlefield. And so at one point, the battle goes from being a battle to being uh, essentially a massacre. The battle lasted roughly 90 minutes. How long did it take for the Mexican army to take stock, figure out it was over, all the defenders were dead, and then decide what to do next? Once the battle begins to wind down, that's when uh, Santa Ana and his staff comes in to sort of survey and and take stock of what is happening. Interesting to me is that this is when Santa Ana and his staff sends word into town for the residents of the town to come in and help with the Mexican wounded. And many of the Mexican wounded are then taken into town, into people's private houses uh, to be cared for. And it's also then decided you know, midday, what are we going to do with the uh, with the slain? And it's decided that the Mexican soldiers who have been killed will be taken to the old Campo Santos on the west side of town. And if you're in San Antonio and you want to know, where is that? That would be uh, where the Mexican market, uh, Santa Rosa Children's Hospital area is. The western edge of downtown. Yes. And so that's where the Mexican soldiers' bodies are taken and buried. And then the decision is made to gather up the defenders and to take them outside the compound. Many people are confused by the cenotaph, thinking that's where they were gathered and burned, but that's a cenotaph is an empty tomb, so there's nobody there. But they were taken to locations outside the compound, piled layers of bodies, layers of wood, and then uh, set on fire. What we call the funeral pyre. Funeral pyres. What did they do with the weapons and supplies? The weapons that could be used were probably put back into service. Uh, we know that at Santa Ana, at one point, his officers had an auction of captured goods in town. So some things were, you know, up for grabs. You could you could buy them. But what we often would get asked is, you know, what happened to James Bowie's knife? What happened to Crockett's rifle? And it's very possible that they were just picked up as souvenirs and, and, and carried off. The body of Alamo defender Torabio Lasoya was found inside the church. He has a really interesting backstory. 
Lasoya is, he's a good example of a, one of the Tejano defenders from San Antonio de Bejar, had been in service for the Spanish and for the Mexican through uh, the Second Flying Company. But uh, many of the Tejanos had uh, smaller Republican leanings, and so they were opposed to the centralization of the Mexican government, and so they joined forces with the Texans. Lasoya is noteworthy for he was born on Alamo grounds and died on Alamo grounds. Yes, and he, you know that that point is made um, in the IMAX film where he says, "I was born in the Alamo and I'll die in the Alamo." But what many people don't realize is that his uh, mother and uh, his sisters are are there in the Alamo as well. You know, they're part of the civilians that are coming into the Alamo because they think that's where it's going to be safe. We also have the story of brother against brother, Gregorio Esparza, a Texan citizen, and Francisco Esparza, a Mexican soldier. When I talk to visitors about the Texas Revolution, I try to put it in the context of this is a, this is a Mexican civil war because people tend to go, oh, civil war, I know what that means, and the idea of brother against brother. But this is the story of a defender who has killed his brothers on the other side. His brother may not be an active participant of, you know, I'm a Mexican soldier, but he had served in the Mexican service. And he asked for permission to go into the Alamo and to get his brother's body and to give it a Christian burial. That's the uh, one of the points that we make about the Mexican soldiers are taken to the graveyard and given a Christian burial, where the defenders are put on funeral pyres which is which is not a Christian burial. That's, you know, disposing of bodies after, well, that's a bonfire. You've spoken about the women and children who took refuge in the sacristy. What did they live through? It is uh, probably sh- sheer terror. And from the accounts of uh, Enrique Esparza and from Susanna, Susanna Dickinson, we get, uh, it's dark in there, it's smoky, the noise from the outside, knowing that your family members are feet away, probably being killed. We'd have uh, accounts of at least one defender being wounded, rushing in, being bayoneted in front of them. You see all this carnage taking place, and you must think, well, I'm going to be killed next. They're going to kill my children. As Mexican officers come in, and sort of restore order, then the the families are taken out. But it, it's still, even though you're taken out, you're taken out into essentially a, the floor of a slaughterhouse. Not too long after, Remember the Alamo becomes a battle cry, one that has echoed throughout the ages. Why is it important to remember what was really a resounding defeat? The Alamo falls into that strange category of, of last stands, and we tend to... Look at last stands. We're, we're fascinated, fascinated by them. In a sense, the Titanic is the last stand. But the you know this, the situation where everybody's going to die just fascinates. But the also what we tend to associate with the Alamo is the determination, courage, universal values. Why the Alamo is not just important to Texas, but to people across the United States and, and across the world because they tend to go, and, and I've had people tell me this from other places, we have a battle like this in our history. It's the, the courage, the honor of dying for something that, that continues on. And for the Alamo, the idea that it becomes a, a rallying cry. And so disastrous battles tend to move people because they, like Travis had said, it's victory or death. And so the decision became, we're going to have to win, or we're going to be killed, or we're going to be pushed out of Texas. So it drives them on to, essentially, they shall not have died in vain. The idea of seeking revenge and having, ultimately, we are going to win. You know, we had Pearl Harbor, but we're going to fight on. We've had these other incidents, but we're going to fight on. You know, it's just a universal lesson of history that the end is 
you know, that things can get better. Things can recover. Dr. Bruce Winders, thank you so much for joining us for this special March 6th episode marking the Battle of the Alamo's 188th anniversary. Well, thank you very much. Be sure to check out the podcast notes. We'll link you to the Battle of the Alamo section on the Alamo's website, which includes profiles of the Alamo defenders. And you still have until March 24th to see the Travis Letter in person at the Alamo on loan from the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. We'll also link to how you can buy your tickets and take advantage of two more free afternoon opportunities to see this iconic piece of Texas history. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast.